All right, this week I'm with Harry Robinson, uh, author of The Men That Made Manchester United, podcaster, regular match day goer. You'll have seen him around the place. Uh, Harry, good to have you on. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we meant to do this some months ago and I, uh, I don't know, I got busy and didn't read the book in time and so on and so on, but I have now eventually read it. Uh, there is a theory when you do long form uh, uh, pieces with, book authors that you shouldn't read the book and just let them talk about it uh, because it makes no sense in audio format for people to be going back and forth about a book they might not have read yet. But anyway, I did read it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, being the United nerd I am, so congrats on that. So um, perhaps you. we can just start with the kind of inspiration, origin, why this amongst the, the many stories uh, about Manchester United. And tell us about what it is for the uh, for the listeners. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, in, in- the shortest format possible, The Men Who Made Manchester United is about the eight, what I judged to be the eight individuals that really laid the foundations for the modern United before Samat Busby arrived in 1945. And the inspiration came initially from one of those characters, Louis Rocker, who I think United nerds and some kind of less nerdy United fans will have heard of this kind of mythical yeah, legendary figure who has all these tall tales about his contributions to the club. And I first read about Louis Rocca uh, when I was seven, six, 17 and this yeah second generation Italian immigrant who joins Newton Heath in 1890, 1892 as a T-boy and progresses to very slowly at first, cleans out the buffs and then manages the kit and then becomes a groundsman, paints the fences. And eventually, at still quite a young age, is kind of acting as chief scout and over the next, what ends up being a 60-year United career, which is something only yeah. kind of really equaled by people like Catherine Reception these days. And there's a few others, but it's a pretty rare thing. Over this 60-year career, fulfills almost every role at United, including supposedly playing in goal for the reserves at one point. And kind of biggest contributions are as chief scout. He's assistant manager to Walter Crickmer when he's so-called interim manager during the war, but he's actually really, I mean, he, he's manager for eight years, so that's not much of an interim. Mm-hmm. He's uh, hes effectively United's third longest serving manager. So I read about Rocker and he claims to have named Manchester United, given United the, the name United when they were renaming from Newton Heath in 1902. And he claims to have signed this player and that. And he he didn't, probably. It's uh, There are certainly some, some myths in it, but he did have uh, an enormous impact on United and was just, yeah, he, he, he's this fun figure, a bit of a flair, yeah. these amazing tales. And, and so that's what got me really interested. And then that was a starting off point, a foundation. And then I started reading. I, I, pretty soon after that, I had the, I mean, pretty instantly I read, I, I always wanted to write a book and I, I saw Louis Rocker's story and went, that's that's good. And then, there might be enough in there to write a book, but kind of commercially, that, that wasn't very viable, a, a biography on a figure from Newton Eve's history. So initially, I started a, a podcast called United Through Time, which was documentaries about about these figures, beginning with Louis Rocker. And the starting point for that was going to the British Library. And I sat in the reading room there and got books out by people like Alf Clark, one of the journalists who died in the Munich Air Disaster, Percy Young, yeah. who wrote a great, uh, a whole load of amazing kind of everything you need to know about United before Busby arrives and, and and through Busby's era as well and loads of others um, and great United authors who, who are still alive like Ian McCartney and Wayne Barton mm-hmm. and all sorts. So I was going through them all. And that Wayne was Barton? The, no. <laughs> no. Scratch him that, off. <laughs> that was one of the, that was a lovely day just going through with a pencil and because you only allow pencils yeah. in the British Library reading room and yeah, taking all yeah, these yeah, notes been, down yeah. and yeah. And, uh, yeah. from there, just, uh, yeah, absolute obsession was born. And then for the next, when it, when it got really into it, it's like you, you start living these, you start to live the characters lives in, in the book. So I became like, I don't know, the whole era came alive to me with people like Charlie Roberts, who, and I got to know the, the descendants of these people. So Ted Roberts, whose grandson of Charlie or Harry Stafford's great grandson or, um, the great granddaughter of John Henry Davies and and Louis Rocker's oh, wow. descendants mm-hmm. as well, and it's like they're they're absolutely buzzing to talk about their ancestor. 
Yeah. And yeah. sometimes they gave me information and sometimes I'd give something to them. It was, yeah, it was just lovely kind of making like Ted Roberts is a, is a guy in his mid eighties, a proper gentleman. He lives um, out in Derbyshire and I went to his house after I'd finished the book to give him, I chatted to him loads online and I went to give him a few copies for, for him and the rest of the Roberts family and just had an afternoon sat by the fire in his, like in his living room and there was a walking stick resting on the um above above the fireplace, not close enough to be setting on fire, a wooden walking stick. And at one point, just midway through the conversation, he went, Oh, that's Charlie's. And it was suddenly like, Oh wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you suddenly it just brings like the the history alive. And then he showed me the old um like uh cigarette boxes that is that Charlie Roberts, the United first great captain, has had as well, and that so that was really special. And the, the writing was fun, but that was that was special. And uh, you, the passion comes through, I think, uh, in the book as well as uh, uh, when you're speaking about it. I mean, so the, so the research process for something like this is pretty in depth. I mean, it's a really detailed book for a start. So hours in the British Library, and and for listeners who don't know, you can't take books out; you have to order them. They come sometimes from there their warehouse i think it's in lincolnshire somewhere isn't it in boston in lincolnshire yeah. and and you just have to sit with the book and the material and they won't let you take photographs and so on and so on so um it's uh, hours of a labor of love to do something like this yeah absolutely and i, d- I did love it like i look some people ask me now well like would you would you do it again yeah absolutely Re- reading about yeah. united's history and finding out new stories yeah definitely the most of the words allowed me to do it um, really was uh, was lockdown. So um, the luckily just before lockdown, a couple of years probably, something called the British Library Archive was launched in association with the British Library and like those sites like Ancestry dot com and Find My Past yeah. com, which were also really useful for looking at family trees and working out occupations and children and etc. But the newspaper archive is what makes most of the most of the information in the book, especially the things that yeah. might not be in in some other stories, comes from that archive. So tr- through, I dread to think how many over over a couple of years, from like big, well known papers like the Times and the Manchester Evening News to little tiny like local ones from Gloucester United might have played an away game. One day, yeah. and Louis Rocker's band of fans, they had a thing called the Rocker Brigade, went. So a lot of time in newspaper archives, scrolling through, and my eyes slowly wearing. Um, but yeah, I would do it again. It was, it's yeah. These story, their stories are so good. Yeah, like, absolutely yeah. privileged to tell them. Uh, no, and I, I, I hope you're able to bring this to a kind of new audience. I mean, um, like fandom these days, is obviously very different, very digital. Uh, United's you know, global fan base is gigantic, and uh, these stories I kind of get lost in the celebrity of football, don't they? And uh, I, I wonder how much um, United's history really touches people. But I hope this can. Okay, let's let's talk about some of the characters. I mean, um, I guess Billy Meredith's a pretty central character in here, and central to United, and also to the book. And uh, tell us a little bit about him and uh, how you explored his journey. Yeah, so Meredith is probably one of. Uh, two or three in a book whose life had probably been covered a bit more. So there's a great biography yeah. written about him uh, by a guy called John Harden, who's written a lot of good football books called Football Wizard Billy Meredith. And he's, again, quite a legendary figure where you don't know whether all of it's quite true. So at the time and in the many, many years after, he's known as this amazing winger who plays with a toothpick in his mouth. And he's, you read that for the first time, you think, is that... Is that true or is that some kind of myth that's been generated in the decades after? It is true. Um, He's known as possibly the first footballing superstar. So an amazing winger, comparable. I spoke to a a Manchester City historian because he plays first for Manchester City. He joins, he he grows up as a a mining boy in a North Wales town called Chirk, who has two pits, both of which provide coal for Manchester, which is a, a hugely industrialized city and mm-hmm. focused on cotton and, and known as Cottonopolis. And Meredith is a, a brilliant amateur footballer, plays for a few clubs, Chirk in his hometown, a tiny team, but they're great. They win the Welsh Cup, the FA Amateur Cup, and so on. Northwich Victoria, 
over the border and um, and Wrexham at one point as well. And he has to be convinced to go and play for Manchester City because he says, I, I like life at home. I like get to play for my local team. I get to, he, he enjoys being a minor, which is not, not something everyone did, um, even as a kind of 14, 15 year old. He goes to play for Manchester City, becomes a, an incredible player, one of the best in, in the league, helps City to get promoted to the top flight and has a, uh, an 11 year career there. So by the time scandal hits in 1905 and he gets involved in this huge controversy, which is, is, is detailed in the book and some people will know about, he then crosses the border to join Manchester United, but he's already in his thirties at this point. Mm. He's a footballing superstar. And, and this is where I spoke to a city historian and they compared him a bit to Cristiano Ronaldo, this amazing athlete who focused had a, a, a great focus on his fitness and pushing the boundaries to see how how much better that fitness could get. So he had a sports shop in St. Peter's Square and he'd sell all these ointments and and rubs and, and whatever to, uh, that he would use on his muscles to try and prolong his career and make him fitter. And he ends up playing until he's nearly 50. So something clearly works. And he joins United in... In 1906, in a very controversial deal, makes his debut on January the 1st, 1907, along with three other Manchester City players who've crossed the, the divide. And he and his teammates, but he leads United to their first Division One title, then the first FA Cup, then a second Division One title into Old Trafford on a first European tour. And then there's so much more with him. He then goes back to play for Manchester City during the war, returns to United after all, back to City and goes on playing. He plays in an FA Cup semi-final in his late 40s and genuinely puts in a decent performance. He scores in the FA it's Cup in his late hope 40s. Hope for us left. Yes. <laughs> well, you're, you're younger. You're younger. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, 40s, yes, I yeah. could make it. Yeah. yeah. I, I was a bit it's, confused it's when you were telling that story because I really thought City were founded in 2008. So um, I, the, it's new to me the that they... Yeah, the OG city. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, not just, I mean, Meredith's obviously a, a really central character in early United and the, the first success, um, but also some of the, the guys who like made United um, or saved United financially or made the club sort of what it is today. So, or, or, or what it became in the early, early 1900s. So, Harry Stafford and John Henry Davis, I mean, names that people will know, of course. Um, who um, who saved the club from financial ruin, helped professionalise it. So, like, talk to us about a bit about these characters. I, I was super interested in these guys at one point. I too spent uh, days and days in the British Library and never completed the book. And I wanted to do this thing that kind of drew parallels between the early ownership, which was kind of philanthropic, really, and uh, and and fan ownership. So during the the height of the Glazer, right. 2010 yeah. period and uh, unlike you I was not dedicated enough to finish it so yeah talk to talk to us about these two characters yeah I, I got lucky with a global pandemic which forced me to do it but um yeah Harry Stafford is what what you hear about the the names and and the stories but what I wanted to what I was interested in and wanted to get across in the book as well and it's partly why I wrote it in present tense rather than looking back, like rather than this happened, this happened, this happened, I wanted to get like their personalities across a bit more. Yeah. Which is once I'd made the decision, regretted it briefly because working out someone's personality 120 years down the line is a, is a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a graft. The newspapers help a lot in that deal and speaking to their descendants help. But so Harry Stafford is Newton Heath club captain. He's, not a particularly good footballer. He's a, a good fullback, but he's he knows his limitations and he takes players down. He he plays the dirty game. He knows that he's probably not good enough to change the game on the ball, but he can stop the better players playing. So he's not a United legend because of what he does on the pitch, but it's in the years 1901, 1902, as Newton Ether on the brink of bankruptcy that he, as club captain, steps up and 
goes initially knocking on doors in the streets of Manchester asking for donations to keep the club alive. And eventually it's through a mad concoction of of, of events where his dog goes missing from a, a Grand Bazaar, the famous mythical story. Another one that you, you hear about yeah. and you think, oh, I, I want to find out if that's true or not. Uh, but also a, a, a an accountant who who works for John Henry Davies's company. John Henry Davies is a, a wealthy brewer, a self-made man who's married into a rich family, but the uh, the rich person in the family doesn't like him, so he doesn't get given any money. So he's a self-made man who, who owns a lot of property and and is a very wealthy, successful brewer. And one of his accountants, th- there's, a, there's this scene between them, which is, yeah, sounds ridiculous, but John Henry Davies knocks over his accountant who's cycling on his way to Bank Street to watch Newton Heath, and he's confused as to why he's so in such a rush to get somewhere. And he says, oh, it's, it's Saturday afternoon. I'm going to watch the football. And John Henry's interested in sport. It, it seems like he was interested primarily in like cycling and bowls and the kind of things you'd expect a middle-class wealthy brewer to be interested in. Victorian gentleman to do, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, rather than the the dirty working-class sport of football. But he's intrigued by it. And over the next few months with this missing dog and this accountant, and it all comes together to a position where together, Harry Stafford, who is a a, a womanizer, a Beer guzzling woman. I, he he is the man drinking in John Henry Davis's pubs, and John Henry is a uh, uh, likes to drink him himself. But is they're they're very different characters. They are at the opposite ends of the spectrum, but together they save Newton Heath and they have this shared passion for what is a community institution and drag it up from the ashes, reform it, and call it Manchester United and change the colours to red and white and. Then over the, the next two years, they're, they're the ones who, who push it forward. And then the other characters start to come in, like the secretary Ernest Magno, like Billy Meredith and Charlie Roberts. But it's those two who, who take what was a dying club, a club who this wasn't their first financial troubles. They'd had it mm. three or four times in their history and they'd been successful in Manchester. They'd been one of the most successful teams in Manchester in the 1880s, but had struggled to ever do better than that really they were Manchester's mm. second biggest club City who were, had been renamed from Hardwick before Newton Heath became United City were, were a better team were in the top flight United were were fine they were a middling second division team who weren't sometimes in a shout of promotion in 1898-99 but they they weren't great and from 1902 when John Henry Davies steps in and yeah you're right it's it's philanthropic he, there's some suggestion that there might be a, a link with the fact that he might be able to serve his beer at games or that he might own the pubs around it or that he benefits from putting the players and, and some like the symbolism of this is a United pub and whatever. But the, the economic benefits of all that just wouldn't have been anywhere in near yeah. enough for the sheer amount of money he invested in into United. And, then there are some questions again when United move into Old Trafford, does it benefit him because we're paying rent? But none of it. I, I thought about this loads and I, I remember reading the drafts back and thinking, have I got that? Have I have I definitely understood what he was in it for? And mm. obviously we can't know without talking to a to a dead man. But it it was he he became so passionate about it and he seemed to love he seemed to go from. It, it feels like he he'd, he'd earned this fortune in business, and he'd got himself to a, a great position, and and then he suddenly found things fell into his lap, and he suddenly found something he could properly care about, and he found this institution that he he would stand on the in the new kind of president's box at Bank Street and look out, and there'd be this huge like tumult of waving arms and excitement. And it feels like he just lived for that moment where he got to see something that he'd helped build. Yeah. Bring bring the masses of working class Manchester together. And that's, yeah, that is philanthropy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's been a truism for 150 years of football that the way to make a small fortune in football is to start with a big one. I, I, like people don't get into, I mean, maybe it's different now with, with vulture capitalists getting into the game, but. It's very, yeah. very hard. And and as Todd Bowley is finding out, it's quite easy to blow a lot of money as well. 
Um, I mean, there's, it's also very true that at any point in that period, United could have ceased to exist. I mean, there was yeah. no, I mean, today that'd be unthinkable, of course, you know, even during the height of the Glazers, like worst loans when like, people like me and, and Andy Green were seriously worried. Um, it, it, it felt too big to fail in that way. But at that point, 1902, could have gone bust and then and united as we understand them today wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have been around uh, it'd have been manchester rovers or something like that um i, I guess the next theme uh, the next theme you come to in your book is kind of loose youth development and uh you know the rise of new jack and um the real focus on youth and how important that became and uh, you know obviously if there's anything that means the united way and i don't know that there is it's it's youth development and it's real uh, we lean on that today, don't we? As as, uh, as the club did in its early years. Yeah, and I, that's all. I've I've always loved following United's academy, even as a kid. Like as as a as I entered my teens, it was, I think we all go through, especially when United are rubbish. We all go through that phase of yeah, kind of distracting ourselves by looking at the FA Youth Cup team two years ago and being excited about Cubby Minor and, and Alejandro Galacho and. Um, but I've always, I mean, I've always loved watching that and yeah, getting to learn that history and, and add, I hope, a little bit to that history was, was. So Nick Cox asked me into the academy to give a talk to staff about Mujak and, and how the history of the academy links to, to what they do today. And I've been lucky enough to do loads of work with the academy. And as a, as a fan, I'm pleased to say that there is loads of that linkage with with the yeah. past and, and full awareness of of the footsteps in which they're following and the the responsibility they have to hold those those values dear but the talk was the point i wanted to make and really the i guess the point of the whole book is so often when we talk about united history we start in effectively october 1945 when Sergeant Major Matt Busby arrives and sometimes even later than that we often forget about the cup winning team of 48 and title winning team of 52 and we just start with the Busby Babes basically Yeah, and United history often goes Busby Babes second division few cups class of 92 treble and so on and on and so, it's so much richer than that and the point I was arguing specifically with the academy stuff is you should realise that youth development is not born out of one man's idea in Matt Busby. The foundations had been laid 13 years before with the foundation of the A-team in 1932. So we spoke about John Henry Davies. The second saviour of Manchester United is James W. Gibson, a, a uniform manufacturer, makes a load of money in the First World War and steps, again, not a football fan at all, but steps in when United are once again on the brink of bankruptcy and the brink of extinction. And there's a sub story to that, the foundation of a third club in Manchester, which could send United properly into extinction. Gibson steps in and within three months of becoming United president, he speaks at a board meeting in late March, 1932 and speaks about the advisability of starting a cult or a nursery team. And that right there is the foundation of youth development at Manchester United, 13 years before Busby's joined. Mm -hmm. Busby at the, at the time is kind of not starting for Manchester City as a player and the A team is founded which is, is in, in terms of an equivalent is probably the under 18s today um, so it's, a, it's more of a youth team rather than an academy and six years on and there's plenty in between but six years on to, to keep things brief the Manchester United Junior Athletic Club is founded Mujak which is, is well known and again, the the foundations laid there still exist today, and that was that wasn't United playing catch up with other teams because they'd been down in the dumps at the start of the thirties. That was leading the way at the mm. forefront, innovation, and those are the things that defined Gibson at United and Crickmo and Rocker and the rest. And in the end, the rest of English football plays catch up after the war. But by that point, the foundations are so strong, even during even after the war, because during it, Walter Crickmer has kept things going. Absolutely astonishing man. You read about, I remember Tony Park, um, who, who 
that created the, the amazing books on United and found all yeah. the records about the academy. I remember talking to him about Walter Crickman and he, he just said, honestly, it just fucking blows my mind. <laughs> the work rate he had during, he had to work a day job in the Old Trafford Police. Uh, and on top of that, single-handedly dragged United through a six-year war while getting crushed in the rubble at one point when the Old Trafford Police headquarters was was bombed. And he was one of the first men on the scene when Old Trafford was bombed. Astonishing man. If If you could ask, if I had to pick one of the characters to choose as kind of a role model for what players, all employees of Manchester United should aspire to, it would be Walter Crickmer. Incredible man. And, and right. then tragically dies at, at Munich and after nearly 40 years of, of service to United. But he keeps the academy going. He keeps Mujak going. He keeps the reserves going. He creates, or is he, he's involved in this innovative partnership with three brothers called the Goslings, which you'll, you can read about as well. And, that means that when the rest of English football players catch up from 45 onwards, so Wolves under manager Stan Collis start to be an incredible force for youth development as well. And they just about, they kind of managed to catch up, but even they're behind. Everyone else is years behind because Bosby arrives and goes, well, that was good. Let's do that again. And four years in, three, four years in, Bosby and Murphy then take it to, really take it to the next level and they mm. they do their own kind of youth revolution at United but they could only do that the babes can only happen because of what came before the war and there's a couple of other clubs who are who who are showing that commitment to youth at the time Everton were probably the one club that United were playing playing catch up with first team wise they were champions in 39 just before the war and they had a good youth team as well but the difference was their youth team Everton B played in a league of under 18s Mujak played against men and the result right. was brilliant footballers and so you get Busby arrives and he has Charlie Mitten at his disposal Stan Pearson Johnny Kerry John Aston Senior plenty of others and he has a team equipped to well to win the league and United fall short twice uh, lose to Liverpool in, in 47 and 48 but then win the FA Cup in in 48 mm. and and that trophy all the hard work in in kind of that is detailed in the book is crucial because that trophy is what really sets the tone for the united we know today so yeah it's success but also listening in ashington is a young lad called robert charlton who falls in love with man united and so when mm. the the chief scout who follows louis rocker comes to the charlton house in the early 50s and everyone in English football wants to sign Bobby Charlton including his boyhood team Newcastle and he says no I'm going to go and join Manchester United because he's fallen yeah. in love in 48 you've got Paddy Crowen listening in in the streets yeah, yeah. of Glasgow it's like that that one game if you could put one game that had a, a just had the biggest impact on the future of the club that's that's in it's a debate for another time but that's in the discussion Right. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you bring up Louis Rocker, and I think you mentioned in the book how he sort of set up the first scouting network, and yeah. and Bobby Charlton from the from the northeast, later George Best from Northern Ireland, and uh, you know, w weren't just looking at local boys. Started to spread the net to to think about how they could bring the best of the best into this New Jack structure. Yeah. So Rocker had always, I mean, Bosby is the one who. Yeah, he takes it up a, a notch and he wants the best talent from the whole of England and Ireland and Scotland and, and so on. Rocco is always, in United's early days, we always went to Scotland to find players. So mm. that's true of Newton Heath in the 1890s because the Scottish players were seen as... as Technical as, and yeah, yeah, gifted. They were, they were the yeah. Spaniards of, of their era. They were the, yeah. the, the passing football. Believe it or not. Yeah, and... Uh, so it starts with Scotland. That goes through to the 1920s because we have a Scottish manager in in um, John Chapman. Rocker often goes to Ireland. So George Best is discovered in the early 60s by Bob Bishop. But the predecessor to to that is a man called Billy Behan, who Louis Rocker is, who plays a, a couple of games for United and is um, a Louis Rocker kind of employee, basically. He's United scout in Ireland. Lombard, George Best is coming mm -hmm. and that's how... 
Johnny Kerry has discovered, the first great Irishman mm-hmm. at, at, at United, the the predecessor to Best. Obviously, Best is Northern Irish, and Johnny Kerry was from the Republic of Ireland, or what became the Republic of Ireland. But the yeah, the, again, the foundation is there. Rocker always wanted to go all around, and he would go to Yorkshire. And so Mark Jones, one of the babes, is is a, a kind of a joint Louis Rocker, Joe Armstrong find, and he's probably the he's right. the player where it passes over because he joins I think actually just after Louis Rocker dies but he's pretty it's hard to be sure but he, he's one of Louis Rocker's final finds comes in from Yorkshire and him and Joe yeah. Armstrong work on it together so Joe Armstrong is already a brilliant scout before he joins United has done a bit of work for Manchester City actually but learns a little bit off Rocker before he dies and then actually Armstrong starts just answering the phones at, at United and then takes over from Louis Rocker and, and lays his own legacy of Bobby Charles and Duncan Edwards, George Best and, and so on. Um, and that's also the nice thing is like you you start to see the chain and you realise that it still exists. So the person who taught Kath Phipps how to use the switchboard at Old Trafford, Joe Armstrong. And there is your link to the very start wow. of Manchester United as a football club. Kath Phipps, Joe Armstrong, Louis Rocker, the people who founded Newton Heath. Like, there you go. It's like four steps, isn't it? Yeah. Back to the the, the foundations. And yeah. That's brilliant. That's that's what yeah. we want, isn't it? I mean, I, what do you think about the parallels with today? I mean, obviously, football is completely different. It's this globalized mega business, and we've now got a, a you know, Petro State billionaire like adjacent. Only Manchester United, who seems to have some sense of the history, which I think people will recognise. But, but there seems there seems something without being too cliche. There seems something you know in the in the DNA of United and and youth development that really resonates with fans even today. I mean, fans will give a academy prospect yeah. way way more time to to get it right than they would a a big signing. Um, it, it seems to be something that's central to United. Yeah, I think youth is probably the one that's at the core, isn't it? I think United can, it's something I've been talking and writing about recently is that I like Asinios are coming in and there's a lot of talk about United's identity being winning. So it's not, it's not really. You can't have an identity that's based on something that ultimately you can't control. If financial fair play was abolished, and that's another subject and we might be closer than I, yeah. I initially thought a week ago. And you've got, you're competing with nation states who can just blow you out the water. Does and, and United are no longer winning things. Does that mean we don't have an identity as a football club? Of course not. Mm. So I, success is absolutely part of what makes United United. And there's, there's no doubt about that. But it's not the central thing that matters. And... I think there's probably two things is youth and risk, taking risks. Sir Alex is, was a gambler. Yeah. I, that's probably it. So Matt was less of a gambler in games like, like Sir Alex was, but the decision to enter the European Cup, the decision to yeah. effectively dismantle a title-winning team, as Sir Alex then does in the mid-90s, dismantled the 1952 title winning team because he looks at Jimmy Murphy's side and goes, they're fucking good. I love some of them. Yeah. And then he brings, and so United maybe could have won a consecutive title in 1953, but he looks at the long term and says, no, I'm going to take a risk on these kids. And they, they slowly come through and that then you have the Busby Babes and it's a, a hypothetical, what would they have gone on to achieve probably win the European Cup much sooner than than we end up doing, probably win a couple of trebles and suddenly 99 doesn't seem quite so special. Um, mm. That's the hypothetical. But yeah, so youth, I think risk-taking is, is certainly one of them. James Gibson, one of the characters, builds, takes the risk on himself to build a train station outside Old Trafford because he thinks it will make it easier to get to the games. It does. They should bring it back. <laughs> Uh, well, they're talking about I it. I'd, lo- <laughs> but, I'd love yeah, it. Yeah. I have this. I have this vision for based on the things I found of like a a new, an updated United 
he could be the South Stand or it could be they're talking about this train station where United's museum starts at Manchester Piccadilly. And so you arrive and there is a platform dedicated to Manchester United, mm. like nine and three quarters at King's Cross. And it feels... Yeah, it yeah. Feels well, great. it used to be platform 14, basically, yeah. didn't it? But, yeah. yeah. And then on the train, you have all this history of Newton Heath because we started as a as, as a team out of yeah. railway workers and then you arrive yeah, yeah. at Old Trafford and you get to see the history. Um, so that's what, if, if Sir Jim's listening, he can, he can have that one for free. But, um, all right. Yeah. 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 No, no licensing deal there. I mean, I, I do think, uh, I mean, you talk about the, uh, the foundations as a, it was a railway workers, uh, working men's club basically. And, and Everton you talked about was a church team and, um, there were, uh, there were community clubs and, and this is what football was about. They were born in local community and, and we're never going back there, are we, in quite the same way. But for all of uh, Big Sir Jim's faults, and, and there are many, uh, the kind of the, the harking back to something local and doing something for the area is something that seems to be resonate strongly with him. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the renewal of Manchester United will be about the renewal of, of that area. Yeah. The, um, I think the parallels in what he said in his first few statements to what James Gibson says in December, 1931 are gen- yeah, genuinely yeah. eerie and they're not the same. Yeah. And I have, we all have our concerns uh, as a, a good mate says, you should never like your owners. <laughs> Yeah, but weirdly, United and and don't get me wrong, as detailed a couple of times in the book, there were times when United fans were angry at John Henry Davis for putting ticket prices up, and there were times the same at, at James mm-hmm. Gibson. But generally, particularly with Gibson, Davies was probably a bit more of an up and down relationship. Particularly with Gibson, fans loved him because he was. When you're talking about like philanthropy, he just. He, he came from a position of being, he played rugby in his youth and wasn't interested in football, but somehow he almost more than anyone got Manchester United and was responsible. It was his vision that Busby then puts into place, that he wanted a United that represented Manchester on the world stage as a great place with a great football team. And yeah, I th- if, if, if that's Ratcliffe's reason for doing it, great. Because ultimately, I think there will be loads of hurdles along the way and and difficulties. But if that's the fundamental reason he's doing it, rather than anything else, I think in the end, the results will be good one way or another. Might not necessarily be winning titles every season, but it will be better than what's come in the 18 years before. And you're right that there were community clubs, even City, and we've we've had a couple of jibes at them <laughs> today and, and we should carry on doing so. But I have more respect for Manchester City having researched this book than I did before. That's a club with its own... It, they've desecrated what was actually a rich history of being a, commu- yeah. a community football club who represented Manchester well and had a good relationship with United. and was was good for its part of the city when they were at Main Road and then when they moved. And yeah, they've they've tired that completely. But I had more respect for them and you do hope that yeah, it's blind faith, but that I hope that in the pursuit of making money, football clubs will eventually accidentally fall back on the things, the values that made them in the first place. And that is having a really engaged community because engaged supporters will pay you more money and will buy more yeah. things and will be invested more. And I, I hope it's going to go one or two ways. It's probably going to go the other way, but maybe some clubs will fall back into that. And I hope United can yeah. be one of them. Yeah. I mean, community still exists in the, in the lower leagues and it's, it's yeah. like there is no TV revenue. There are no mega global sponsorship deals unless you're Wrexham. Yeah. And, uh, community matters and, and too often owners forget that. I mean, if you look at what's happened at South End over and over again, an owner who's just 
you know, ran over that community and they go out with buckets raising money to save the club and he uh, he leaves it until 11:59 and 59 seconds when the the bailiffs are about to remove the seats from the stadium and goes okay yeah I'll pay the bills this week and I, I, like you know that I just think that's so incredibly depressing to forget the roots of of uh, our clubs and you know especially especially Manchester United but but all clubs are rooted in their local community and and for all Sir Jim's faults he seems to get that and I think blind faith as you say I think it's about legacy for him and it, his legacy is to restore some of what Manchester United was both in stadium and the local area and the train station and and uh, investing in younger players which he says he wants to do and all of that then I, I'm good with that for you know despite um despite all the other things that may come with modern football uh, <laughs> So have you got a have you got a another project you're working on what's coming next? Uh yes, I'm in a very very early stages of thinking about next book which will also be on United history but will go up to will focus on specific players but from the start up to the the modern day. Um but in terms of other projects I've been if people are interested in this they'll probably be interested in the academy and um I've yeah. done a series of documentaries with MUTV about the Academy, which is called Lifeblood. Um which nice. has been yeah, absolute joy. <laughs> and like as a as a fan who cares about yeah. that stuff, especially in a dip what has ended up being a we had a brilliant end to season, but in a difficult season, getting to spend time seeing how closely the Academy sticks to the values it should stick to is on a Monday or Tuesday morning after a bad game is like, yeah, just bathe me in this, this, this brilliance and an amazing season for them. So getting to be behind the scenes for that was, yeah, absolute dream. And um, yeah, so if people are interested in that, they, they can watch it. It's called Lifeblood. Excellent. Yeah, um, I'm I'm sure that um, I'm sure that's an awesome doc. Uh, I, I it makes me think of the '99 doc uh, on Amazon that came out recently, and uh, so much of that is filmed at the cliff. Yeah, uh, which they may have given a lick of paint to, I think, uh, for the filming. I got to um, I got to do a tour of the cliff with. So right. episode one is about the academy's history. So um, Tony Whelan, academy stalwart, who came through as a player, never made an appearance, but came through as a player alongside George Best, and and later played with Best. Uh, I think at Fort Lauderdale, somewhere in the US. Right. Um, and then has been a coach at the Academy and support staff more recently, but has worked at the Academy since the mid 90s. Amazing man. Like, key, if you talk to Marcus Rashford, he will mention Tony Whelan. Yeah. Huge impact on so many players who have come through at United. And he gave us a tour of around the back of the Stratford end where the Jimmy Murphy statue is, telling me about how the Busby Babes used to play there. And then we went to the cliff and he gave me a tour around that old building that's featured in 99. And yeah. the building is an absolute like treasure trove of of amazing things. The, the old dartboard is still up from, because there's, right. there's two buildings at the cliff. There's the new one with yeah. the indoor Astro that's used very regularly for academy games at like under nine, under 12 level, etc. Mm. And then there's the old building, which has been... A, basically only occasionally used for academy games since we left in 99. So the dartboard is in the canteen, which they used in the treble season. There's like an old pair of like Adidas Kaiser boots hanging in the boot room. There's all these little bits that are, that are still around. And yeah, going around that building was was brilliant. As, as a United nerd, it was like, oh my God, it's like history before your eyes. And yeah, that building's special. Again, that should be a museum. It's yeah, what yeah. other club can say you can sit in the drain in the change room where the treble was won literally yeah, no other yeah. no that that would be amazing i mean it used to be a routine um i'd go to games because they used to be saturday mornings you go to the youth game have a couple of pints go to the old Trafford in the afternoon it's a bit more yeah. difficult these days but yeah um yeah, venues aren't quite close together. Sir Jim, build that academy stadium so we can yes. uh, we can do that. That's my, that's my. If you want my final vision for, for United, is uh, round the back of the Stratford End where the Busby Babes trained on cinder in the post-war period. Yeah. 
there is now the perfect chance for a three-stand stadium overlooked by the statue of Jimmy Murphy looking down onto the pitch. And what's great about it, from an Ineos point of view, you wouldn't even have to build new dressing rooms because you could use the ones in Old Trafford and just walk out onto the pitch. And then, yeah, Jimmy Murphy looking down at academy games. So that, that's, that's symbolism. All right, Harry, uh, the book is called The Men Who Made United. And uh, p- plug your pluggables. Where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Harry Robinson 64 If you want a copy of the book, you can buy it on Amazon and Waterstones, etc. cetera. Um, it's better for me if you buy it off me. So message me on Twitter and I can get Very you good. a signed copy. Awesome. And you do a podcast? Yes, the Manchester United Weekly Podcast, which doesn't need explaining. <laughs> It's weekly (laughs) and it's about Manchester United Uh, and you do work for MUTV uh, and uh, yeah, say hi to Wayne next time you see him. I will do. Thank you very much for for joining. This was a pleasure. A few months later than planned. Uh, You're off to the Euros. Yes. Yeah. Off to the Euros in a couple of days based in Leipzig. Have a fantastic time. Thank you. And uh, yeah, soon to be Manchester United manager Gareth Southgate leading the three lines to... uh, an ignominious uh, quarterfinal defeat, <laughs> probably. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It might be a good Dear season me. next year. You never know. You never know. Yeah. There's always hope, but you know what? United endures, and uh, that's the thing. It's, uh, you know, we're not going to die because we finish eighth in the league. Exactly. Own it, enjoy it, and enjoy the successes when they come. Yeah. Harry, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>